My name is Dr. Zimmern from Dallas, and uh, my co-authors are Dr. Sarah, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Roger Gopal is a PhD, and myself. My background as a clinician is struggling with retinal tract infections and the problem of antibiotics. Once you have a, a biofilm and the bacteria are attached to the bladder wall, the antibiotics don't work, as we know. So the question is, what can we do to not use antibiotics? And there's some work ongoing in our lab on phage and on gallium, and I'm presenting our work on gallium. One main mechanism of uh, UPEX survival that you may or may not know is through iron uptake. And so UPEX have genes coding for sidorophore, which basically uptake the iron, and sidorophore receptors that allow them to survive, and gallium is an inhibitor uh, through basically competing action with, uh, <coughs> against uh, iron. I have uh, no disclosure, and I'm uh, funded by my own institution. Now, gallium has been used. Uh, it's under FDA approval for a uh, gannite, which is used for the treatment of bladder cancer. And there's been a phase two trial ongoing now for a patient with cystic fibrosis. Our interest was to look at whether the bacteria in the urine, we call UPEX, and pseudomonas, which are very well known to grow ex excellent biofilms, would respond to gallium uh, or not. So in this study, we had a, um, several different strains, which I would like to present to you if my mouse works here. Um, we had patients with retinal tract infections whose urine was collected. We have a series of them. Those were the patient 5 and 12 in the series. We had UTI 89, which is familiar to many of you. This is the Scott Holgren strain. CFT 073, which is Harry Mobley's strain. And then we had a bacteria isolated from the trigon of a patient that we've published before and reported on. And then we had a control, which is E. coli B. And then we had two very strong strains of pseudomonas that we've used in a lab before, making excellent biofilms. We look at the standard, which is basically gallium sensitivity disc, play with them with these different strains, and look at the zone of inhibition around and measure the MIC for the gallium, which is the zone of inhibition around this disc. We did the standard biofilm assay using a standard crystal violet assay, which is based on spectrophotometry at OD600. And then we look at iron competition, specifically for pseudomonas strains. And all our uh, assays we've performed in triplicate and report as mean with standard deviation. So first thing important, UPEC growth is inhibited by gallium nitrate. Here are the different strains. This is the micromolar uh, uh, concentration. So obviously the control has the lowest need to, for inhibition by gallium. And the quite resistant CFT073 is the highest concentration, but still all UPEC seems to respond to gallium nitrates. Likewise for pseudomonas, which was more expected since this has been shown in the lung situation, the Boston 4501 is very hard to get rid of. Uh, that's the highest concentration of gallium we had it to uh, use, but it's still micromolar, which is pretty small. We looked at uh, gallium quenching to look at the uh, interaction with pyroverdin, which is a pigment made by pseudomonas, and you can see clearly an inhibition of this pyroverdin. So it does work, and this is at nanomolar concentration, much more lower concentration. And then finally, we look at biofilm. And biofilm, uh, we, we mostly study the very well-known, these two bacteria that are very well-known, and very rapidly at low levels, you get uh, an inhibition that continues on. Pseudomonas is much harder to break the biofilm, but still we're able to get some pretty low concentration to affect the biofilm in this uh, bacteria. So this is the first basic inroad into looking at the effect of gallium on UPEX and pseudomonas, and uh, possibly for us maybe to start working at the uh, bladder level with direct intravesical installation to break the biofilm and have more effect on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, Kate Moore from Australia. It's very exciting work. If you were to use this in humans, uh, would you instill into the bladder? That's our plan. Uh huh. Because it says for intravenous treatment of bladder cancer. Yeah, it's been used intravenously, and there's an oral compound as well called gallium maltitate, which uh -huh. has been published. But uh, we have a patent for intravesical installation. The goal is basically to try to intravesically affect the biofilms, and then we're right now working on, obviously, antibiotics to see 
the other mean antibiotics, how they would interfere. We're doing that in an animal model at this point, but our plan obviously is to use it in human at some point. Presumably you would have to do it quite a lot, uh, many installations to we, get the bacteria. That's, that's a good point. We don't know the, the technical yeah. details. Right now, at least we have a signal that this is a potential application mm. Mm. of gallium, and it's important because iron is a key element yeah. here for bacterial growth. And this is the only, and it's a very safe compound. It has already had FDA approval, so it's more the question of how to deliver it so that we can affect the biofilm and maybe have a way to remove yeah. these bacteria that are embedded in the wall and are very impossible yeah. to get out of. That was my next question, toxicity. So it's a, is it a large molecule? It doesn't go across? It doesn't, from what oh. we know. Yeah. Uh, as I said, we know that it can be given intravenously and filtered through the kidney. Mm. This would be a direct installation, yeah. uh, but you know, Give me a few years to figure out the how to do it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Eric Zhou from Taiwan. Hi, Eric. Thank you very much. It is a very nice study. So I noticed that the material method, the patient enrolled who are postmenopausal women. Could you tell me why? Well, uh, it just happens to be the population <coughs> that's studied the most, and that's the one that has the least amount of information in the literature, as you know, because there's a lot of data on 25 to 40 year old women, but not too much on postmenopausal. So that's a group I see mostly in my practice as an FPMRI specialist. So we've now done for years, uh, gathered the urine. So we have a, a bank of, of urine of these people. We have sequenced their uh, bacteria, E. coli, and so on. So we know more of the, the target, and that's what we chose these people. How does the garium work to inhibit the biofilm? What is the mechanism? We don't know that. Right. It's a good question. We don't know that. This, um, we're, we're working into that with another group of people trying to figure out you know, at which level it affects the biofilm. It's the first signal that we have an effect on biofilm, which is you know, uh, something we've been hoping for for a long time. We've tried other compounds, mm -hmm. uh, LED209 and some others. This one is the first one that we seem to have an indication of the biofilm effect. But the, how it works at the biofilm level, I don't have that answer yet. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just ask a question as well? We, we have a paper coming up later, and it's well recognized. We get uh, intracellular bacteria. This is not going to do anything for intracellular bacteria, is it? Well, if we can get through the biofilm, the hope would be yes, because then you, know, the, you could potentially get there with, uh, with antibiotics. Why not? They can't penetrate get to the IBCs. Once you get past the biofilm protection, you could get there. Is it absorbed through the umbrella cells? I don't think anybody knows the answer yet. We, we've done some animal studies, but I don't have the, the result of that yet to disclose. And one other supplementary question. I mean, how much or how common is biofilm in the bladder in the absence of a catheter? Is it something we see? I think women with recurrent infection, we see that all the time. You get all these areas of cystitis cystica, trigonitis. Uh, that's the portal of entry for germ. They get into the trigon, they anchor there, and then they basically proliferate. And once they're inside the biofilm, as uh, the Holgren model has well shown, you can get them out of there. At least not with antibiotics. We do fulguration, we burn them out, that works quite effectively. But as far as using antibiotics, your patients do get better while they're on mm. antibiotics. The minute you stop the antibiotics, as we all know well, for those of us who are clinicians, the symptoms come back. Okay, any more questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Mm.